This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. My father left Taiwan for the United States in 1965, when he was 21, and he'd be nearly twice as old before he set foot there again. In those days, you left if you were able, especially if you were a promising student. A dozen other physics majors graduated alongside him from Donghai University, and ten of them ended up pursuing careers abroad. My father flew from Taipei to Tokyo to Seattle to Boston. He scanned the crowd for the friend who'd come all the way from Providence to pick him up at the airport and drop him off in Amherst. But his friend didn't know how to drive, so he, in turn, promised to buy lunch for another guy, a man my dad didn't know, in exchange for a ride to the Boston airport, then Amherst, and finally back to Providence. The two young men greeted my father at the gate, traded back slaps, and rushed him to the car, where they stowed the sum total of his worldly possessions, textbooks and sweaters mostly, in the trunk. Then they set off for Boston's Chinatown, a portal back to a world they had left behind. Camaraderie and goodwill were fine enough reasons to drive hours to fetch someone from the airport. Just as important was the airport's proximity to food you couldn't get in small northeastern college towns. In the years that followed, a willing maroon far from home, my father acquired various characteristics that might have marked him as an American. He lived in New York, witnessed and participated in student protests, and, according to photographic evidence, once sported long hair and vaguely fashionable pants. He arrived as a devotee of classical music, but within a few years his favorite song was The Animals, House of the Rising Sun. He subscribed very briefly to The New Yorker, before realizing it wasn't meant for newcomers like him and requesting a refund. He discovered the charms of pizza and rum raisin ice cream. Whenever new grad students were set to arrive from Taiwan, he and his friends piled into the nearest available car to pick them up. It was a ritual, and was a type of freedom, on the road and possibly eating well, that was not to be passed up. If Americans at the time knew anything about Taiwan, it was as an obscure island in the vicinity of China and Japan, where cheap, Plastic things were manufactured for export. When my mother was a child, her father set up a chalkboard in the family's kitchen, where he would write a new word in English each day. World War II had interrupted my grandfather's medical studies, so he became a civil servant. He wanted slightly more for his children. My grandparents had my mom and her siblings choose American names, like Henry or Carol. The children picked up the basics of English, this bizarre new language which they might use to speak a new future into being. They learned about the rest of the English-speaking world through a subscription to Life magazine, where my mom first discovered the existence of something in America called Chinatown. When she arrived in the United States in 1971, Taipei to Tokyo to San Francisco, the family who picked her up had the decency to wait a day so she could recover from the long journey before taking her to eat Chinese food. She was on her way to study public health at Michigan State. Soon after she got to East Lansing, signed a lease, enrolled in classes, and bought a stack of non-refundable textbooks. She received a message from her father. It turned out that as she was making her way to Michigan, a letter had reached the family home in Taipei, informing her that she'd been accepted to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, her top choice. So, my mother recovered whatever tuition she could from Michigan State and quickly departed for Illinois. In the 1960s, communities of students from throughout the Chinese-speaking world found one another in these small, relatively remote college towns. Most of them adapted to the changing seasons, a different register of conversational pleasantry, the rolling fields and endless highways. School anchored my mother to the Midwest, but she roamed freely. A job at a community center in Kankakee, where she was the only person who wasn't black, her first up-close glimpse of America's racial divide. A summer spent waitressing, where she ate ice cream every day for lunch. But some of her classmates couldn't deal with this radical new context, or maybe it was a lack of one. She still remembers one girl who stopped going to classes altogether, spending her time drifting around campus. Even at the peak of summer, the girl wandered around wearing her heaviest winter coat. All the other Taiwanese students kept their distance from her. There were the potlucks with friends when my mom would make lion's head meatballs, road trips to famous landmarks or grocers that carried bok choy, the bustling communion of dorm life. You could identify a Taiwanese student by their da dong, rice cooker. My mom took up painting, much of it abstract and surreal, color patterns that didn't reveal a discernible mood. 
When I later asked if she'd been on drugs when she made them, she assured me she never smoked weed back then, even though she still remembered what it smelled like. After two years at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, my father transferred to Columbia University. From there, he followed his academic advisor to the University of Illinois, which is where my parents met. They married at a student center on campus. If they had lived closer than three hours from the nearest Chinatown, they could have hosted a restaurant banquet. My mom's brother, who'd left Taiwan as a merchant marine and ended up in Virginia, was the only person from their combined families who was able to attend. At least they had their friends. One of them was an artist, and he drew pictures of Snoopy and Woodstock on cardboard and arranged them in the grass outside the student center. Everyone brought their favorite dish.